Chapter Three of Mademoiselle Ix by Lenoy Falconer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was well that Mrs. Merrington was spared the sight of the letter, for she returned home sufficiently disturbed as it was by Mrs. Barnes' suggestions. Mr. Merrington, to whom after dinner she confided these anxieties, made light of them after his usual easy and somewhat unorthodox fashion. Oh, pooh! if she does her work well what does it matter what her views are was his conclusion especially as she doesn't trouble us with them eve you are a nice young lady upon my word you never told that unfortunate perry that you were going out to tea and he has been kicking his heels half the afternoon waiting to see you why what could he have to say to me amongst other things that the cosmo foxes are coming home to-morrow i am very glad said evelyn mademoiselle Ix is very anxious to see mrs fox mrs merrington determined to appeal to her sister and wrote to her next day to ask for further particulars and assurances concerning mademoiselle Ix and her history the answer which arrived by return of post was slightly indignant in tone i am not the least surprised wrote lady carline to hear that your Pussyite vicar and his wife are not satisfied with that good bible christian mademoiselle Ix, i earnestly pray that she may be enabled to counteract the effect of mr barnes pernicious teaching on the minds of the dear children as to mrs barnes insinuations no doubt mademoiselle Ix, poor thing after renouncing her popish idols i wish mr and mrs barnes could say so much for themselves was for some time rather unsettled as to which was the true faith but i am happy to say she has for some time found rest in the italian protestant church a sounder one than our own in many ways i should think she must be amazed at some of mr barnes antics in church if he goes on in the way he did when i was with you however if you are not satisfied pray let me know at once i can easily get her another situation lady castlemore would be thankful to have her after reading this mrs merrington felt not only comforted but bound to offer some sort of apology to her sister she was busy over the composition of this when the sound of a distant horn reached her ears and evelyn came hurriedly into the drawing-room to announce that the cosmo fox's coach was driving up to the house a few minutes after this mr and mrs cosmo fox with perry entered the house and a high-pitched female voice resounded through the hall well my dear mrs merrington here we are you see we haven't lost any time in coming over have we well how are you you all look blooming after all i believe country air is the best why evelyn i declare you've grown yes you have and how are the chicks all very well i hear you have got a dragon of a governess who keeps them all in fine order i'm sorry for that they won't be half so nice i hate anything kept in order except husbands yes mrs merrington husbands should always be kept in order i do my best with cosmo but he is quite incorrigible how jolly this dear old drawing-room looks and how nice everything feels after london well now what has been going on here i hear one of the miss harolds is actually engaged what a blessing for her mother and the others mrs masters has been up telling me all the gossip it is part of her business as a clergyman's wife you know to collect all that don't you think so i hear they've got a terrible clergyman at barton who gives them sermons half an hour long miss duncombe isn't engaged i'm sure from her face she looks very desponding we met her and lady duncombe on our way here what do you think i did i took the reins from perry and borrowed his cigar till we passed them oh you should have seen lady duncombe's face cosmo didn't half like it afraid i should upset the coach nonsense how nervous you are getting during the course of this speech the whole party had established themselves in the drawing-room whilst greetings and inquiries had been generally exchanged it was impossible without suspending the ordinary business of life to pay unremitting attention to mrs fox's remarks fortunately she did not expect it being too absorbed in the pleasure of talking to be very exacting as to the quality and quantity of her listeners she usually addressed herself to the company generally and in that there were sure to be two or three who willingly listened or appeared to listen while watching a creature so lovely 
to-day she was provided with two faithful admirers in mr merrington and evelyn who had taken their places on either side of her mr cosmo fox conversed with mrs merrington in the low soft voice which was usually drowned by his wife's vociferous chatter i hope cosmo and you are not going to run away again directly said mrs merrington cordially when mrs fox paused as she was sometimes compelled to for breath oh no we shall be here till the week after easter at least i shouldn't have come down so soon only cosmo took upon himself to ask some people down without consulting me yes he says he asked me if it would suit me to have them on the fifteenth and i said yes well so i did but then i hadn't idea when the fifteenth was i never know anything about dates i don't want to or about hours either yes please cream milk sugar anything you can give me muffins i should think so i adore muffins thanks thanks who are coming to us well let me see the austins first these are the people cosmo asked he is rather sweet on mrs austin between ourselves ha <laughs> ha then nelly and katie woodward i don't think you know them such jolly girls not pretty but up to everything then my cousin captain leslie you know him handsome isn't he you mustn't fall in love with him evelyn or perry will never forgive me monsieur delaine and sir george and lady rigby you remember lady rigby immense and the colour of a peony i think that is all isn't it cosmo oh mercy yes i forgot the count the most important of them all his name oh don't ask me his name i can't either spell or pronounce it he is a russian and an old friend of cosmo's well you knew him years ago didn't you when you were abroad he's very much in love with me yes he is cosmo very mashed indeed and so am i oh he is such a darling and so hideous frightful do you know the first time i saw him it was only last week he has just been in england about a month i thought he was the missing link it was at a dance at lady dunmere's you know she is a scotchwoman and never sees anything like a joke so i said why lady dunmere it is a gorilla isn't it and she said quite gravely oh no dear he is a russian count but he dances divinely divinely i wanted him to come down to us at once for i never was so taken by any one but he couldn't come till thursday next is it not tiresome he has gone off with these stupid dunmeres to their place in scotland i told him he would only catch his death of cold and get caught by that gigantic miss dunmere but perhaps he may come to us sooner after all for it seems he is very restless and flies about from place to place just as the fancy moves him just what i should like to do how i wish i had married him and sometimes he goes off quite suddenly in the middle of a visit cosmo thinks it's because who on earth is that it was mademoiselle eeks standing in the doorway her eyes had turned naturally enough in the direction of the beautiful speaker but she had come in with a large bunch of daffodils gathered in the woods for mrs merrington finding that the family were not alone as she had supposed she hesitated diffidently to enter come in come in mademoiselle cried mrs merrington you are just in time for tea you must have a cup what lovely daffodils perry rose to find her a seat evelyn hastened to pour her out a cup of tea and mrs merrington introduced her to the cosmo foxes mademoiselle eeks took the place offered to her next to mrs merrington and described in answer to that lady's inquiries where the daffodils had come from meanwhile mrs fox stared at mademoiselle eeks with unconcealed astonishment who on earth is she she said to mr merrington the new governess what an extraordinary-looking person where on earth did you pick her up chinese i should think from her eyebrows well she is ugly mrs cosmo fox like a good many other people had a habit of assuming that nothing she said could be overheard unless she intended it so to be mr merrington who did not share this illusion began to feel rather uncomfortable and rose to his feet cosmo he said i want to show you the stables since you were here last i have had them ventilated on a new plan it works very well are you coming perry with the departure of the men the exuberance of mrs fox's spirits seemed somewhat to subside she leant languidly back in her deep chair and looked round as if in search of amusement 
evelyn observing this proposed that mademoiselle ix should play them something i ought perhaps to be looking for my pupils said mademoiselle ix consulting her watch i'll go and see after the children said mrs merrington delighted to exchange the task of entertaining mrs cosmo fox for a much more congenial occupation you play some of your pretty pieces to mrs fox do you like music madame asked mademoiselle ix pausing on her way to the piano beside mrs fox and according as she did so the most remarkable contrast ever presented by two beings of the same sex time and social community well yes if it is not too classical said mrs fox stifling a yawn and stretching out her hand to take an album from the table now what will she play thought evelyn watching the foreign governess curiously it was something which she had never played before at least to evelyn a waltz with a long undulating measure and that undertone of sadness which appears inevitable even in the dance music of this troubled age all this was carefully accentuated by the player but her dexterous fingers or something of which they were but the well-trained interpreters infused a much more potent charm into the swaying melody the spirit of the dance was in this playing the essence of that poetry of motion which lives in the rise and fall of wind-tossed boughs and leaping waves as well as in the rhythmic play of subtle human beauty evelyn it affected like a spell and even the much less susceptible mrs fox was moved and roused by it lovely distracting one must dance to it she cried springing to her feet and rocking to the music with a grace as perfect as her beauty the hall is the place to dance in said mademoiselle ix without pausing or looking up true said mrs fox evelyn let us have a waltz there the hall was very wide and high rising to the roof of the house where it was lighted by an enormous skylight all the chief rooms opened on to it the bedrooms being reached by the open gallery that went round three sides of the hall the last side was taken up by two flights of the staircase which led to this gallery and an enormous piece of tapestry covering nearly all the wall above the stairs soft rich brown was the prevailing hue in wainscoted walls and balustrades and in the polished floor over which the feet of the young dancers now glided so nimbly you play divinely cried mrs fox returning to the drawing-room with quickened breath and heightened colour but you have thoroughly unsettled me and i know i never shall be happy again till i have had a really good dance london one never dances in london one is knocked about and one's dress is torn there is no room to dance the country is the place oh how i wish we had anything like your hall and i would give a dance to-morrow but that stupid castle is all cut up into little rooms and our big hall has a stone floor i wish to goodness your people would give a dance evelyn surely all that mrs fox desires is granted said mademoiselle ix still playing but playing pianissimo what in other people's houses said mrs fox smiling oh everywhere said mademoiselle ix gravely oh yes said evelyn snatching at the idea presented i am sure if papa would give a dance to please any one it would be for you oh dear mrs fox do ask him i have never been at a real dance in my life and i shall be eighteen next month you poor ill-used little thing well i don't mind if i do where is mr merrington as if in answer to this question the sound of men's voices was heard outside mrs fox rushed to the window and threw it open mr merrington she cried leaning out and clasping her hands with a pretty gesture of entreaty i want you to do something to please me promise me you won't refuse who could said mr merrington gallantly well now remember you have promised i have witnesses i want you to give a dance a dance repeated mr merrington evidently taken aback quite a tiny one you know i don't mean a regular ball i only want you to let me bring over our party one evening and have a dance in your lovely hall now you must not look like that you know you have promised mr cosmo fox with his usual sleepy deliberation took his cigar out of his mouth and began i must say zephine no cosmo you need not say anything at all you have nothing to do with this now mr merrington you don't object do you oh no i don't 
object said mr merrington who had bethought himself of an excellent way out of the dilemma but i am not the person to ask i am only the master of the house you must consult my wife you know thank you thank you thank you cried mrs fox kissing her hands to him at each word and she disappeared from the window a few minutes later mrs merrington came into the gallery through the red swing door which led from that part of the house to a wing shared by the servants and children a cry of satisfaction from below instantly greeted her appearance and as she slowly descended the stairs mrs cosmo fox's piercing voice was lifted in explanation of the unusual aspect of the hall my dear mrs merrington such fun what do you think your angel of a husband has invited us and our party to come over and dance one evening in this splendid hall isn't it charming there never was such a place for a ballroom you see mrs merrington by just taking the big chairs out and moving the table up here like this you get more room than ever and the piano and the fiddles with a little squeeze might get under the staircase a small cottage piano you know hawkins generally sends his own you'd have his men wouldn't you they're not expensive i hate dancing to amateur playing don't you they always leave off when they are tired we shall have three dancing men in our party at least and i'll tell you what i'll do i'll ask some of them over from carchester you like that evelyn for they all dance splendidly they really do not like that stupid oomph who do nothing but lounge and eat supper we haven't settled the day yet have we it must be next week because the week after is passion week and if you gave a dance then mr barnes would excommunicate you or rather mrs barnes would <laughs> now all our people come on saturday on mondays we have some old friends to dine what do you say to tuesday i think tuesday is the day do you agree mrs merrington mrs merrington certainly did not object in words for of them she was bereft by bewilderment and surprise and mrs cosmo fox taking the most desirable view of this silence burst forth again more eloquently than ever oh thank you a thousand times mrs merrington thank you awfully we shall all make our appearance on tuesday next by the by will you ask any one else for we are going on to the heralds shall we take them an invitation i will save you the bother of writing the sun dances very decently you know and they really must scrape some men together to balance all these heavy girls do you think the duncombes would come in lent i think it would be only kind to give poor miss duncombe a chance and i would like to have lady duncombe i always enjoy flirting so much more when i know she is looking on and taking notes but then if you ask her you will have to ask all the people near barton and they are such a hopelessly stupid set well whatever you do evelyn don't forget to engage hawkins men in good time you know a violin a violoncello and a piano i say won't it be glorious the coach was now heard crashing over the gravel sweep before the front door the servants came into the hall to attend to the departing guests and at the same instant mr merrington mr fox and perry entered by a side door it is half-past five and more zephine said her husband if we are to be home before midnight we ought to start mr merrington cried mrs fox it is all settled the dance is to be on tuesday next we've arranged it all haven't we mrs merrington we shall put our furs and things in your room i think mr merrington and eat our supper in the dining-room and flirt in the drawing-room what is the matter with the clasp of this cloak i cannot fasten it allow me madame said mademoiselle Eex. what the devil is the meaning of all this said mr merrington aside to his wife you know best my dear said the lady coldly at the same time mademoiselle Eex, readjusting the silver clasp of mrs fox's fur cloak which had got bent in some way was saying did you say all your visitors arrived on saturday madame yes all have you got it right oh thanks because continued mademoiselle Eex, arranging the cloak over mrs fox's shoulder as she spoke i fancied you spoke of one who will not arrive till thursday was it mrs fox stopped suddenly with a start in the act of fastening her cloak gracious goodness she almost shrieked do you know what i've done i've forgotten all about the count he doesn't come till thursday he won't be here for the ball 
good-bye my dear mrs merrington said mr cosmo fox gently as he pressed her hand in a farewell clasp how your head must ache and how you will enjoy a little quiet after all this hubbub my dear zephine i will attend to what you say when we get into the carriage nothing will induce me to trespass further on mr and mrs merrington's patience and accordingly he left the house and climbed up to his place on the coach all this time mrs fox protested wildly and continuously the count the count my dear cosmo you don't understand oh perry stop him my dear mrs merrington what are we to do the dance will be nothing without the count you don't know how he waltzes put off the dance oh goodness no never put off anything pleasant he must come earlier that's all whether the dunmeres like it or whether they don't i must write to him to-night and insist upon his coming on monday or tuesday at the latest you won't be in time for our post observed perry if that matters the postman calls for the bag at six perry called mr fox from without do not wait for zephine we will send the carriage back for her what a brute he is cried mrs fox clasping her hands what is to be done it's two days post to dunmere at least the letter will never reach him in time if i don't get it off to-night why do you not write the letter here then madame said mademoiselle Ix. the suggestion was accepted with delight and while perry was dispatched to explain the delay to mr cosmo fox and if possible soothe his impatience mademoiselle Ix and evelyn hurried off to find writing materials mr merrington looked on in moody silence mrs merrington's brain was in a whirl their silence was not very conspicuous as mrs fox afforded them no opportunity of speaking she wrote her letter standing at the hall table and talking incessantly all the time now what shall i say to him there isn't time for any ceremony i shall simply say if he doesn't come on monday i shall never speak to him again perry you poor dear old thing don't let cosmo drive off he's capable of anything i say what a scrawl there a blot it's all cosmo's fault evelyn if you marry a husband with a taste for punctuality crush it at once how many r's are there in hurried that's right an envelope please oh heavens how does one spell his name perry run and ask cosmo how the count spells his name evelyn you will stamp this letter for me are you sure that it is right perry what gibberish now dunmere castle dunfield what county is dunfield in frithshire did you say mademoiselle frithshire how clever of you to know let me see do i put m b or n b for scotland there evelyn for heaven's sake take care that letter goes good-bye mrs merrington so jolly of you to give a dance good-bye evelyn don't forget to write to hawkins men good-bye mademoiselle cosmo you ought to be ashamed of yourself i haven't had time to say half i wanted to say good-bye mr merrington you and i must have a dance on tuesday a square dance i mean i am not quite sure of your step and besides the remainder of the sentence was drowned in the noise of wheels and hoofs upon the gravel as the coach drove swiftly away mrs fox was really gone and the stillness she left behind was solemnly impressive the servants proceeded to rearrange the hall evelyn and mademoiselle Ix went off towards their own wing and mr and mrs merrington retired to the drawing-room to decide which of the two was responsible for the impending entertainment when evelyn joined them about twenty minutes later this tendency to reproach each other had given way to unanimous condemnation of mrs fox mrs merrington gratified by this unusual instance of right judgment on the part of her husband in whose eyes mrs fox and her doings were usually perfection was disposed to take a more cheerful view of the prospect after all i dare say it won't be so much trouble or expense i am afraid mrs barnes will be displeased at our having it in lent but really one cannot satisfy everybody and i do not quite approve of all this fuss about times and seasons i shall not have much of a supper they cannot expect it at such short notice supper indeed said mr merrington warming himself on the rug and looking half amused half angry i wonder mrs fox didn't order the supper when she was about it i shouldn't give them any supper oh daddy said evelyn nestling up to him and rubbing her curly head against his shoulder in a kitten-like caress you know nobody would be more disappointed than yourself when supper-time came do i looking tenderly down into the laughing face 
well perhaps i had better eat when i have the chance as the day after i shall probably lunch at carchester jail oh papa as if a little dance like that could ruin you i'm nearly ruined already it's the last straw you little rascal all you care for is the dance i dare say after all it was you who started the idea confess no indeed daddy who did then mr merrington hardly expected and did not wait for his answer he pinched his daughter's soft little ear threateningly and departed leaving evelyn to follow a curious train of thought suggested by his question if any one did start the idea was her conclusion it was mademoiselle x poor mademoiselle Eeks, as if she could have any interest in having a ball i don't think dancing is much in her line but i am very much obliged to her all the same these reflections were interrupted by mrs merrington who now looked up from her writing-table evelyn my darling you will ruin your complexion and your eyes too if you sit staring into the fire like that i wish dear you would go and make sure that i have put down sure on my letter to hawkins or those stupid post-office people will send it up to carchester in hillshire is it in the bag mamma yes i put it in quite half an hour ago and i cannot remember whether i put down sure on it or not make haste my love the postman will be here directly evelyn obeyed humming mademoiselle Eeks's waltz and crossed the hall dancing to its music the only lamp as yet lighted threw a small sphere of brightness over the oak table on which it stood there lay the post-bag still unlocked it was very full and evelyn at first could not find what she wanted finally still singing she emptied the contents of the bag upon the table distinguished the letter to hawkins made sure that it was accurately and fully addressed and then bundled all the letters back again in doing so her eye caught sight of something which made her stop singing and hastily snatch up one of the envelopes it was the one which not an hour since she had watched mrs cosmo fox fasten down and address in the meantime the direction had been altered the words dunmere castle frithshire n b had been erased and claridge's hotel london substituted in mademoiselle Eeks's small foreign and unmistakable handwriting End of chapter 3